Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we are discussing ecocentrism. It is a topic that was brought to us by one of our listeners. John, do you remember the name? Oh, no, but name? I can, let me pull that up. Go ahead and Well, keep while it. you pull that up, we'll definitely go ahead and give them a shout out. But in the meantime, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Triple Carmelite. From the Bastille's Family Brewery in Bugenhout, Germany, or Bugenhout, Belgium. And they have been brewing this since 1791. Oh. So uh, I, I'm kind of excited about this. I hope uh, it hasn't been sitting since 1791. <laughs> the name of the listener who requested is Sylvia. So thank you, Sylvia, Sylvia. for this request. So this is going to be a fun one. <laughs> I'm kind of excited, but I don't, I don't really know what to expect with it. So it's okay. uh, it, it's going to be interesting. Are you driving the bus on this one? Uh, no, I'm driving a Ferrari. Oh, okay, okay. Well, yeah. Only one of you is welcome to join. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if we're if we're talking about ecocentrism, you have to drive like a hippie bus with uh, that runs on biofuel. Runs on biofuel and, and vegans. Can you can you Ooh. run a hippie bus on vegans? Oh, on that sounds, vegans. That sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah. You just burn vegans inside it in order to, to, to get it to operate. So, uh, my notes did not save to my keep. Well, this ought to be interesting. So, then. just wing it like we always do. I can do that, I suppose. Uh, so, anyway, um, ecocentrism is one part of three centrisms uh, kind of geared around our focus in uh, in society. Eco, or there are three of them, as I mentioned earlier. One of them is typically the more prevalent one in Western societies, uh, anthropocentrism. Thank you, Mike. Um, and then we have biocentrism. Oh, I guess I should explain what anthropo yes, anthropocentrism absolutely. is. Yes, absolutely. Anthropocentrism, um, think anthropomorphic, anthropology, is human-centered. Um, it's yeah, Man-centered, yeah. Yes, uh, and then we have biocentrism, which is life-centered. Um, so it's going to focus its attention more on um, on humans, animals, plants, anything, Any living that, thing. anything that's yeah. living. Whereas ecocentrism is more a focus on the whole of the earth, organic, inorganic matter, all of that. <clears throat> um, and this particular philosophy came about... Um, I guess it was coined by Aldo Leopold. I am really surprised I remembered that. Um, he was a, a professor at the University of Wisconsin, um, did a bunch of other things, but essentially he was one of the major, um, major founders of environmentalism, um, which ecocentrism is largely, uh, largely tied to. Go ahead. I was going to ask, because you said ecocentrism is a focus on kind of a holistic approach to the earth. But, yeah. Uh, and you've done way more research on this. This is more a question than a critique. But mm -hmm. um, does ecocentrism stop at the earth? Like if somebody was like considering the entire solar system or the universe and, 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 and trying to talk about things like should we eject our trash into into deep space and, and how that would affect things. Yep. Would that be ecocentrism or does it does it have hard lines at the edge of the earth? So it's interesting because it seems like in the philosophy itself, it should encompass everything in the universe. However, and I think this may actually have something to do with a couple of different things, one of them being that the people who were focused on studying and developing this as a philosophy um, recognized that we don't have a whole lot of ability. You know, you've said things like ejecting trash into into the earth, and when this was being developed, that was, if it was a thought at all, was a very far fetched idea. Um, but even more so than that, this is an idea that, um, as the listener who recommended this show to us um, <clears throat> mentioned, there are societies like, you know, we've heard about some of the Native Americans who um, uh, revered life as a whole and kind of um, wanted to be at one with the earth in sort of a, a transcendental way. Um, 
But I would say if you're referencing some of the older versions of this philosophy, it's probably because they didn't know any better. So, so it could apply more broadly than that, but it seems that the focus has been strictly to the earth. So I, I guess to, to make sure I'm understanding what mm -hmm. you're saying correctly, uh, there's nothing stopping it from expanding past the earth. But the problem is during the large uh, developmental phase of this philosophy, the earth was the boundary of anyone making the philosophy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I think it sounds like as, as we expand our own, uh, our own frontiers that, that the philosophy would expand with it. Yeah. 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 If or maybe a new one developed that's more yeah. encompassing. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. If and when we uh, colonize Mars, it will extend to Mars as well and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's an interesting idea that and, – and I was just looking at some stuff here that, that there's some argument as to whether or not it is um, – in violation of anthrocentrism, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, are 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 you in fact by uh, by by protecting the environment at a uh, at a higher level than 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 uh, than man? Are you violating the rights of, of man with that? Because I, I've looked on here right while you were talking, and there's there's two different schools out there. There's mm -hmm. one that says no, you're not, because uh, by protecting the environment, you are in fact protecting man. Mm -hmm. And another points to things like well. You're actually costing man uh, 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 a lot of benefits they have now. Right, fracking comes to mind, but that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, uh, you know, do does it say, or is the idea of of ecocentrism that um, that there that, that that if you know if it benefits man but it hurts the environment that you that that, that you don't do it? That, do you violate man's rights over over environmental rights? Right. Well, and that's one of the interesting things. Um, you know, you mentioned two different schools of thought, and I actually kind of wanted to touch on that because there seems to be a lot of um, competing information out there. One one school of thought seems to lean more toward a, they've called it biospherical egalitarianism, which, if you know, we, we discussed earlier the three different centrisms, so it would stand to reason that this is more life-centered. Um, they're not trying to apply egalitarianism to inorganic, inorganic material. Um, could you, for, for some of our, our listeners, could you, you define egalitarianism here? Um, I would actually rather look that up because I, 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 I can up. give Egal a rough. Yeah. Egalitarianism yeah. is usually defined as, uh, as, as equality of opportunity and not pure equality, uh, okay. at, at, at yeah. least in, in political science circles. So yeah. I would assume that's, that's where you're looking. The difference between equality is where everything is treated, uh, if everything comes out the same. Egalitarianism is where everything has the same opportunity to come out okay. the same. Yeah, that, and that's that's where I've always had the difficulty in, uh, in kind of explaining those two, but I think you did that really well. Yeah, so um, I'm looking at the definition here. It says the doctrine that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. So the opportunities is the key part. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, this may answer my question. The, the question that was going to come from that, the reason I asked for mm -hmm. a definition, because that was kind of my understanding as well, is is when you talk about applying egalitarianism, you stated, uh, I want, I'm going to use the word flippantly, but maybe not in a negative sense, that they're, they're not trying to apply egalitarianism toward inorganic matter right. or, or non-living things. And, and my question was, well, why couldn't that be the case you, you seem to say it as right. almost like a well obviously they're not um well and I, I think that would be because they don't have um there it is inanimate material it, it is not material that pursues any sort of life path because it has no life that was one of the arguments i was just looking at it here is is that um the uh the supporters of ecocentrism i keep wanting to say ego ecocentrism is uh you know they're they're constantly fighting this battle of, you know, are are we uh, are we saying that that the rock has as much mm -hmm. rights as a as a living being? And that's and, and, what I took from it yeah. at the very beginning when I started. And, looking and, and at that's it. that's not what they're saying. Right. Uh, I, I think what they're saying is is essential to protect the ecology in order to protect the rights of living. Yeah, because mm because -hmm. I had a thought experiment dur during this whole process where where I was trying to apply moral views. To this view mm -hmm. and, and see how it kind of lined up. And, and my, my thought experiment was this. Imagine in the far future we find that we can much more better preserve 
ecosystems and various life forms by building a giant ark. Because well, the earth has a lot of stuff that we're just not utilizing. It's in the core of the earth or whatever. We build a giant ark ship where everything can live together. And we can explore the galaxy and get resources as big needed. Big damn ark. Yeah. And then we take all the matter that's not required for the ark ship and for, you know, feeding and, and all that. And we consume that in a very futuristic, efficient process as fuel for the ark ship. Now... Uh, in this thought experiment, we have preserved every bit of life in the ecocentrum, <clears throat> e eco, not ecocentrum, ecosystem, ecosystem um, and in fact improved the lives of many things, right? Uh, but in doing so, we completely consumed the earth, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that um, an ecocentrist would have problem with this. So, <coughs> uh, unfortunately, we don't have one here to kind of grill on this. Um, and I think there's probably other people that would have problems with it too that aren't ecocentrists, right? Well, that's that. What you're talking about there, I think, is is this idea of industrocentrism. Mm -hmm. That's the idea that um, that all the commodities on Earth are, 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 are everything on Earth should be seen as a commodity to be used by by humans or, right. or, or by by living things. And that's a little different. Well, I, I well, well, it is. But but here's where my thought experiment comes in. So consuming the entire Earth for the betterment of all life is obviously against ecocentrism. Centrism. It's bioindustrialism. Right, but it's against ecocentrism, right. regardless of what you call it. So then my question becomes, okay, well, we have a much smaller example where we have a, a fallen dead tree and a few humans need to burn that log to be warm. Or you have a rock and you're going to chip it away and make an axe out of it. Well, I think ecocentrists would have a much smaller problem with destroying this small rock or, or at least reshaping it or uh, transforming this log in, in, into energy for, for the, the benefit of, of humans. So where does that like weighted scale fall mm -hmm. of why is a log okay, but the entire earth isn't? And, and I know those are extremes, but where does that balance, how does that balance work? Yeah. Well, and, and so there are a few things that I want us to consider here. Um, so I mentioned to you earlier when we were kind of talking about this, um, that I, f I feel like a lot of the ecocentrism movement um, was politically motivated not saying it was wrongfully or rightfully politically motivated, but uh, they were coming about in a time we were seeing um, we were seeing a lot of um, wildlife that was either becoming endangered or flat out going extinct. Many, um, even just talking within the U.S., um, you know, we had seen the uh, what was it the buffalo that were all but hunted to extinction. Um, the carrier yeah. pigeon. Yeah, well, carrier pigeon was hunted to extinction. Well, or, yeah, that or, or one was. was. Buffalo has, has recovered. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and through the work of um, of the environmental movement sure, sure. or em environmentalism movement, um, which was spurred on largely by this, and so I think there's an ability to argue that it's had some positive impact. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, we've talked on the show kind of about um, life and and what place we have there. And I think the question that we have to ask here, when the argument is that we should, we should not be using so much material that it is detrimental to others, uh, other species, <coughs> excuse me, um, and that... Uh, so we shouldn't be using so much material that it's detrimental to other species and that we should actually be working to improve those other species. But I find that to be largely anthropocentric as well, simply from the perspective that we are imposing our own views on what it means for them to be damaged or to be better. Um, and so I have to wonder to what extent you have to go to get out of that anthropocentric sphere. Well, well, sphere. And I think you can distinguish anthropo anthropocentric views from that. And that has to do with motivation. For instance, um, I can 
let's say that there is a, a creature that is completely not helpful to humans. I'm going to throw one out there. I know it is helpful to humans, but that whether it is or isn't isn't the point of whether we can imagine that it wasn't. So let's say the mosquito, right? The mosquito is completely unhelpful to humans. It, maybe the environment's changed and it doesn't do anything good for us. And we can decide to eradicate the mosquitoes because we don't like getting bit, right? And, and, and that would be an anthropomorphic, anthropocentric, anthropocentric view on it. Now, we know that same information, but we then say, you know what? But mosquitoes' lives are important, too. And I think that's the line between uh, anthropocentric and bioprocentric. But here's my question. If, if you sit there and say that we should... We should preserve everything in, in the way that it's most helpful to life, I don't see the delineation between bioprocentrism and ecoprocentrism in that view. That that's that's the one that really, you know, kind of confuses me. Well and I, I do find it in in many aspects difficult to separate ecocentrism from biocentrism when we're talking about um, humans impact. Because you can look at our um, extraction of oil and, and use of that there's there's kind of a, a presupposition that what we're doing is we're destroying it but we're not really destroying it we're trans uh yeah we're changing you're, you're it into changing something it. else yeah. well yeah. i think you could uh, you could argue that about about, about most things yeah, you know whenever you could. when you're chipping the rock away you're not really destroying it you're changing its form mm -hmm. when you're yeah. burning the uh the, the log you're not really destroying it you're changing it to something else yeah and so to what degree is ecocentrism saying that we are not that we should not be changing the form of anything yeah i think one of the big challenges to, to this whole philosophy i think it was probably uh much easier to develop a crisp philosophy with, with hard edges around it, around this idea before science progressed to the level that we realize uh, this principle that matter, matter, energy, the combination thereof cannot be created or destroyed. It, it always exists. Only be changed. Yep. Yeah. And exactly. Because then you, you could make arguments that, well, we shouldn't have less things in the world. We shouldn't uh -huh. destroy things. But once you kind of come to the realization that nothing can be destroyed, now we're no longer <laughs> talking about should things exist because that's beyond our, our limit of ability, our power. Mm -hmm. When we burn that log, we didn't destroy it. We just changed its form. Now we're having a really interesting argument about the form of things. Mm -hmm. What form should things exist in? Right. And, and, you know, when we, when we talk about whether we're, we're burning oil, as you said, or turning the, the, the world into a giant space habitat, or even something like diverting a river, right? The river was in a form. Once we divert it or build a dam on it, it's now in a new form. But how do we... But it's not the same river. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How yeah. do we, how do we sit there and say that form A is better than form B or form B is better than form A? We have to find some scales, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we can't use... One easy thing to do when we're deciding whether to destroy a rock or destroy a person, we could say, well, the rock has more mass, it has more stuff. But now that we realize that the rock could turn into part of the person by eating a little salt or, or vice versa, now we, we can't even argue mass. So so it really gets down to, to an aesthetics or, or argument and is of a, form. Is, is, is a big rock more valuable than gravel? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you wonder about that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I... I I think it comes down to focus. It comes down to, uh, you know, you talk about, about the difference between biocentrism and ecocentrism. I think biocentrism will always come down on the side that life is more important. While ecocentrism looks at the thing and they say the earth is more important than any life on it. Yeah. It is more important to preserve the earth as a living being mm -hmm. than it is to preserve man or carrier pigeons or buffaloes. So well, the earth is buffalo. What I Go ahead. Here's what I find interesting about that, because that thought occurred to me as well. However, if it is our charge <laughs> as humans to do everything that we can to preserve the earth, then it seems to extend very easily that it is our responsibility to preserve ourselves as well. well but, but, and at what point, in what way do you have to balance that? But it, but it doesn't. In fact, if, if you really fundamentally believe that the most important thing is to preserve the, the, the body of the earth as it is, 
the best thing you could do is is, is remove people. But but how do how do people know that in a thousand years an alien civilization who does not share our values of preserving the earth then come along and, and consume it, right? In in their yeah. some beavers you know. take down trees all the time. They destroy the habitats of squirrels and birds in order to build dams. They do. And but in, should we not be um, should we not be preventing them from taking the homes of other animals? Yeah, yeah, and, and it comes down to to do you do you value the changes that animals make higher than the cha- than the changes that that people make? And I'm distinguishing people and animals here. You know, right. we all know that they are, but but do you do you distinguish those as different? Mm-hmm. Because if you don't, if you go through and, and, and say that people are just an animal. Then there is not really a difference in us cutting down trees to build houses mm-hmm. and beavers cutting down trees to build dams. Right. Yeah. It's just a, a it, I mean, it, it's a it's a natural creature doing what comes natural to them, and that's part of the system. Then that's the struggle sh- you run into. Well, and then in what way does it make sense that humans should be eliminated in order to preserve the earth? Yeah, yeah. I, if I, our actions are equal to those of the other animals, yeah, it's, it's a riddle. You've got and, and, and you've got to you've got to figure that out, and, mm-hmm. and you've got to wonder if there's a is there a um, is there a balance there where you look at it and say uh, it, it, it is consciousness a, a, something mm-hmm. that, that that's there. Beavers, uh, as far as we know, don't have the consciousness to decide to go build something. They just do it because it's instinctual. Mm-hmm. We have the consciousness to do it or not to do it. I think the argument would be more along the lines of sentience. If you're using those maybe, anonymously. Then. Maybe. Uh, I, I'm using it as a conscious decision. You're making oh, a choice. Okay. Uh, but, but, yeah, okay. Uh, but but I, I think there's something there that, that, that you've, got to, you've got to think about. Is there a difference between those two where one has the ability to say – you know what I'm doing is destructive. I know it's destructive, so I shouldn't do it. The other doesn't have that ability, as far as we know. Well, and and, and this, you know, to me, kind of comes back to a podcast we did. Oh, was it two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks ago, um, on on privilege, right? Mm-hmm. And, and we we talked about responsibility, and, and we we've, we very much centered that podcast around uh, inner human inner anthropomorphic privilege, like how my privilege as a human compares to yours. But is is maybe there an argument here, and maybe the center of this argument is is kind of uh, as humans as these much more intelligent and powerful creatures comparatively, uh, kind of the same that we have a certain amount of privilege as a species, and and we are owe it to be good stewards of the the less privileged beings or you know when you're talking about ecocentrism centrism maybe not even beings but the less privileged things yeah. you know well and I, I think that is exactly where intentionally or otherwise um ecocentrism as it was promoted around the time that that leopold coined the term um i think that's its goal is to say that we should be good stewards of the environment um in fact <clears throat> You know, his his big efforts were around wildlife conservation um, and, and things like that. And uh, see, I can't remember the guy's name because I don't have my notes. I want to say his last name was Ford. Um, he built the cars. Not that one, though. Okay. Yeah, different one. Um, one of the things that he, he expressed as far as ecocentrism goes is that if humans are, are doing a thing – that is negatively impacting organic or inorganic matter. They should change those actions, um, whether that means changing societal perceptions, passing laws, et cetera, et cetera, um, to either be benign to the environment or beneficial. Um, I do have some problems there with how you determine um, when you are being destructive, benign, and beneficial. Um, (laughs) But again, I think the politically motivated side of ecocentrism is still anthropocentric with a mask. I wonder if you can separate, if you can separate uh, man from, from, from being (coughs) centered. I, I I just, I I look at the way we've done things uh, and sometimes we've done things for ecological reasons Mm -hmm. that have had, Serious negative effects. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're right here in, in, in East Texas in the Piney Woods. Um, 
and and you know we're known for our our, our tall pine trees and all this. Pine trees aren't native to here. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. not native. We brought them in here. Trees. We brought them in here, and and if you look at it, they've come through here. It was an environmental decision to bring them in, and they take over, and they take over, and they 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 grow faster, and they and they spit they, on your trees. Well, they end up cars. they end up choking out your hardwoods, and we have we have seriously adjusted the environment, mm-hmm. um, believing we were doing something good for the environment. I didn't know that. Now I'm fascinated because I've. I've you know, whenever I'm told the, the stories of early America, I, I imagine like uh, Native Americans running through pine trees. And now I realize that was not the case. Mm-mm. Now, and the that, settlers the whole... that came in from Alabama and Mississippi, they brought them into East Texas. And they just, they grow faster and they, you know, they, they get up here and they, they choke out the sun. And your yeah. your slower growing deciduous trees are choked out. History mm-hmm. just changed in my mind. So, it's, uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know, but, but again, that was something that we were doing for an environmental cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think about... Um, Bahia grass, Bahia grass mm-hmm. coming in, uh, or, or kudzu. Kudzu brought in kudzu. because of the, you know, in, in, in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, that area, the the ground was 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 blowing away during the dust bowl. So mm-hmm. we brought in this kudzu, thinking that it would it would you know save the earth. Instead, it took over everything. Yeah. Um, you know, there's. I got to see some of that over the summer. Still anthro. I, I mean, I mean, we're we're still having an effect whether we are trying to or not, and yeah. I wonder whether we can get past that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and. And there is a school of thought very similar to transcendentalism within ecocentrism. And I, I think, I say very similar, I think they may just kind of merge like the beams in Ghostbusters. Um, but Don't bef- cross the beams. But but they did. And and I think that's what ecocentrism and transcendentalism in the, in the does. Movie. Yeah. yeah. But before we get to talking about that, I want to talk about this beer. Absolutely. I'm going to drink some more of it. Yeah. You're, you're kind of low there. I, think. I am a little low. Do you want to start? Uh, no, I want a little more. You want a little more? <laughs> no, I'll start. Okay. Um, so I've I've really enjoyed this. Thank you very much, mm-hmm. Mike. Um, it was nothing like what I expected. It's got a sour taste to it, but it's most definitely not a sour beer. It's um, tart, kind of limey. I really, really like it. It's refreshing. I think this would be a fantastic beer on like a a brisk, leaning toward warm spring day. Um, If I was going to rate it, which I probably am. Sometime. You you have to rate it at some point. (laughs) Just refuse. Um, I I find it very difficult to, to describe this. Other, the tartness is the stuff is the part that um, that stands out the most. It's there's not a lot of hops to it, um, and the weedy taste even seems to be largely in the background. But it's, I like it a lot. It's a, it's an exceptional beer, and I'm going to rate it a three point two. A three two. I think it's a three two. Um, All right. Really? Yes. Really? Were you dropped in your head earlier? I was dropped on my head way earlier. Okay. <laughs> Okay. You want to go, John? To I'll, I'll go ahead because okay. I, I think you got some stuff to say here. In a really? Little bit. Um, I really like this. I think this is light beer done right. Um, a, a lot of times, you know, I, I'm not I'm not the biggest light beer fan, and, and the critique I'll make of it is it's watery. I've used that term a lot mm-hmm. of times. This has light flavors, but it has flavors. It's a full flavor experience. Mm-hmm. You never drink this and think this is water. Yeah, there, there's a bit of sour notes. There's also a bit of a of a, a transition that's a little bitter and just a, a little sweet, almost like. And I only know this because I've brewed enough. Some of the sugars of the grains are left in, and you really get that grainy, earthy flavor. Like toward the back end, right after. Yes, you swallowed it. absolutely. It's got a smooth transition through, <laughs> except for the very beginning. That sour kind of hits you a little strong. It but, does. But after you get over that sour speed bump it's a very smooth all the way through it burps well too it does this is not <laughs> my my favorite beer but i think that's a lot more to do with style than it than it has to do with the beer itself um i'm gonna rate the other high it's 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 not going to uh to break some of what what my favorite styles of beers have oh done my god really I'm giving this a three eight. A really? three eight. Okay, even you are batshit crazy. You All are right, batshit crazy. Even Torpedo I think that's thing. high. Oh god. Torpedo this thing. Why? Why this, would you do that? Because it's awful. It's, what? It's, I, I don't. I don't I, it, it is too sweet. It is too bitter. It is too thin. It is nothing like what I would want to drink here. This is. I a, am the crazy one. This is a 
My problem Did is, somebody have an M berry before the show? My problem <laughs> is I think this beer has an audience, and that audience will really like it. So I I, really like I'm it. in a rough situation here where I where I think that the audience for this beer is going to, going to say this is a good one. I am not the audience. It is way too sweet for me. I, 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 don't, I don't want that. I don't want that sweetness here. It is super thin. It you, is. Know, you called it watery. Mm-hmm. This is this no, no, is, no. I was saying it, it wasn't watery. I've described it wasn't. others. Like yeah. it, well, it feels it, it's, watery. It's, it it's is, not heavy. It is very thin, and mm-hmm. and and I don't I don't like that. I, I, yeah. You know, um, it it tastes to me almost more like a. a a champagne than it does a beer. It doesn't have that. It doesn't have that. Doesn't have that beerish flavor to me. Like if you and took I the dryness just, out of champagne, maybe. Yeah, I maybe. just, I, I just yeah. the, the, the carbonation. I'm not crazy it about it. Like a wine. It smells like a wine. It doesn't. It's very floral smell. I um. Honestly, if I'm rating this as 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 me, I'm going to give it a terribly low rating because I I I, I don't want I don't want to drink this beer uh, really? over and over again. But I'll I understand yours. there's an audience for it. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to have to give it a higher rating than I want to, but uh, I'm going to give it a I'm going to give it a two two. A two two. You yeah. said two two. That's higher than you want. Wow. Oh yeah, I'd give it. I for for me personally, I'd give it like a one. I, I really am not a fan. Wow. wow. I'm, I'm 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 not crazy about it at all. It's uh it's not my not my beer. I think it is an audience's beer. Hashtag um, not my beer. <laughs> yeah yeah. It's just uh, so that's so disrespectful, I get it, John. I get it completely. Um, okay. But it's uh. Just, just not. It's just not at all what I want. So, okay. um, if you're a, uh, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't that even. No, I wouldn't even put this as a lawnmower beer. It is so sweet that it's. Uh, it's. It's like a dessert. It's. It's just not at I all. What I almost feel like from what you're describing, like I, I do hit a tinge of sweetness. But when you describe the sweetness of this beer, I almost feel like we're drinking different beers. I don't yeah. know. It tastes like a like a like a champagne punch to me. Almost. It's just. Hmm. It's not. It's not a not beerish to me at all. Uh, hmm. And, uh, That's why I asked if somebody and it, had what's had weird memory. is what's weird is I've, I've been saying every week that I've, I've been a little sick and my taste buds are off. I feel pretty good right now, and uh, <laughs> I, I think my taste buds are right for the first time in weeks, and it tastes I when nothing special to me. When I gave it a three two, I thought you were gonna like. You were thinking it needed to be higher at first. Oh, good God, no! no. I really thought you I were gonna like this beer. I can't believe you two would put this that that high. This is not. This doesn't strike me as y'all's beer at For all. For the type of beer that this is, the yeah, but, ratings definitely seem flip flopped. Well, okay, one of well, the best light beers I've had. Yeah. <laughs> It, it just it's just barely beer. See, and maybe this is because <laughs> we're not light beer people. Maybe, maybe this is a light beer for not light beer people. Maybe, maybe. maybe. But, uh, I really expected y'all to be very low on this. Hmm. I, I didn't think. Let me ask you this because y'all, we, we kind of have done this, had this argument before. Do you uh-huh. rate a beer as what it's supposed to be, or do you rate it as do you like it or not? And that was my struggle in this one. Yeah. Y'all rated. I think y'all rated this as. I'm correct. Y'all rated this as what it's supposed to be, right? I tried to do a bit of both. If you were rating, like, is this I, is this your beer? And I'm, I'm I'm trying to ask. Yeah. If you're rating it as, do you enjoy it? Are you going to give it give that high of a rating? I so so let let me kind of explain that. I like this beer. If I'm just rating it purely for like my enjoyment, it still hits low threes, high twos. I mean yeah. already. Uh, the reason I rated it higher is, you know, and, and, and this doesn't have to just do with the style, but it, it's kind of related to that question, is sometimes you want a plethora of, of, of beers that you can choose from. You, you want, want a dark plethora beer. of beers, not a plethora of beers, yes. Well, I want a plethora. You can <sighs> like what you want. Um, and, and, and you want a light beer. And, and if, I'm, if, if I'm picking my, my spread of beers, this is the light beer I pick. Yeah, right? when I get a flight, this is going to be... The light beer that I get. Yeah, so so that's where it gets a, a little bit of a boost because it's the best of the light beers, but it's not because they hit the style correctly or mm-hmm. they didn't. It's because it's doing the best in its. Ca- Does that make sense? I, I understand. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. yeah, and and for myself because I feel like my taste on beer fluctuates. I try not to weight too heavily my own preference to it. So I try to kind of find a middle ground between the type of beer and how they did with that and do I find it to be enjoyable. Yeah. You know what this is? And and, and I am taking back my statement that this is a light beer I picked. This is not. This is like a second or third. This is Lefe with less spices. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. I just I I, I don't 
I, I can't tell you exactly what's wrong, except it's too sweet and too carbonated for me. Yeah. And I just, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for me. Not a lawnmower beer at all to me. So, um, yeah, I think this beer gets you late unless you're trying to fuck Mike. <laughs> you don't get to fuck Mike. I, I've got to tell you that, that I don't have any beer will get you late. So, uh, okay, fair point. Uh, fair point. And, 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 and which date? Um, you know, this is hard because I, I've learned that this is a much more controversial beer than I expected it to be. <laughs> so maybe bury this one a little deeper in the back. pack. Uh, when you're feeling a little bit secure that, that you know, this isn't going to be a deal breaker for you. But you want to learn something. You want to learn something. So. I got, yeah. I, I got to tell you that if you're if you're trying to date me, this is the beer that you give me when you want to end it. <laughs> because because we're over at that point. So, uh, all right. Uh, so back I think they've to, got a pretty long list of beers to choose from for that date. They, they do. They do. Yeah. They do. This is right up there, though. This is right <laughs> up there for me. So anyway, um, <clears throat> ecocentrism and transcendentalism. So the place where it seems most... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> the place where it sees, seems most... <coughs> Excuse me. The place where it seems most logical that a person attempting to practice ecocentrism could remove the anthropomorphism uh, anthropocentrism as much as possible is the place at which it intersects with transcendentalism and this is in the idea that the idea that everybody um human animal plant rock are all part of the same energy um are all indistinguishable from each other um the idea that uh no one, no individual organism is individual, and there's no end or beginning between um, people, between my feet and the floor right now, or my body in the air, or my body and my clothes, and so on and so forth. I think that is, and, and this one actually takes a, a lot more kind of high level, I think, um, philosophical twist. Whereas the other side of ecocentrism, I think, has more practical application. And this one, I think, is more a sort of life practice. You, you know, when, when you say that, as you, as you talked about, everything has, has a certain amount of equality, whether you're talking about the air and, and all that. It, it, it almost, as I well, think about it, uh, gives a certain amount of... I don't want to say human qualities. I want to say life qualities. Um, a certain amount of consciousness uh, attributed to things we don't normally consider conscious. And it, as I think about that, it makes a lot of sense that Native Americans adopted this practice because they very much, and, and a lot of early religions, uh, believed in the idea of the sun having consciousness, the moon having consciousness, sure, sure. you know, on and on and on. And, and uh, it, it's almost an idea of respecting the consciousness of of nature um and and to do so you have to kind of adopt it because as mm -hmm. i think of the idea of killing humans you're really talking about a state change of humans a, a, a lively state to a dead state and i can certainly uh compare and contrast earth and mars and while they have or Mars has lost a little bit of mass due to solar winds and everything it has relatively the same mass that it did a long time ago but I can I can look at at something about that planet, about the planet Earth is much more lively than the planet Mars. I don't know what that is. It's the flowing waters. It's the movement. It's all this. There's something much more lively there when I look at it than when I look at Mars. I say it's kind of. It would almost make sense to say it's a dead planet, yeah, yeah, a yeah, term yeah. we use often. Okay, interesting idea. Uh, but 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 the fact that you're that you're making that distinguishment between uh, life and, and, and death it, it is, is very, uh, I don't want to say anthro, but, it, but it's very life-centered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, it's biocentricism, but biocentricism, as it's, it's normally understood, takes the classical view of life in, in these very um, carbon-based life-form <coughs> terms, like a squirrel. You can definitely see the difference in a squirrel in a river. <coughs> But we can also look at a river and say it's a very lively river, or after it dries up, it's a dead river. And those sure, terms sure. make sense, but there's also something different than that in the squirrel. We, mm -hmm. we can distinguish those three sure. things. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Uh, between an, or an organism and, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I can see that. I can definitely see that. Well, and I, I want to clarify something in what you were saying, kind of your analysis of, 
of my definition of this branch of ecocentrism, you mentioned an equality between organisms. And, and I think that kind of misses the point. The point being that everything is one thing. And equality isn't necessary when there's not but one. Well, so the, 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 there's a problem there. There's a problem with taking that view that everything is one, mm -hmm. right? Because you quickly get into this idea of, you, you can argue this, right? I'm going to die to preserve the river, but I am part of the river, so I live on. Mm -hmm. But then you really easily get to take the opposite view, like I'm going to destroy the earth, but I'm going to live, and me and the earth are one, so mm -hmm. the earth lives, right? When you when you talk about it's not equality, we're all one, the problem becomes that destroying something <sighs> separate from yourself becomes no more trivial than clipping your toenails, right? I mean, that was part of you. You didn't need it anymore. You, you clipped it. and Well, destruction ceases to be a thing that can happen. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that that's a really problematic idea for the view of, of oneness mm -hmm. uh, that I don't know if ecocentrists are widely adopting that view, but if they are, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a philosophical issue they need to, mm -hmm. to come to grips with. Well, and I think that it's a non-threatening view on a very small scale. Um, I, I think the problem is when that view starts to become adopted on a wide scale, mm -hmm. um, because I think you can take either the idea that, you know, I want to frolic in the meadow that is also a part of me, or these are all parts of me and I'm going to use them to build up the biggest industrial empire in the entire me. I'm going to pick all my flowers because they're pretty and I like yeah. them. I like them here better. Yeah. And they're all part of me. Yeah. So I have that right to do it. And so when you have one or a small group of individuals, which I know doesn't fall in the, I, I'm speaking non uh, transcendentally ecocentric when I describe this, but when you have a small group of individuals who are practicing this, this philosophical idea, um, there's little damage that they can do. But if we were to all adopt it, it could be a serious problem. Well, yeah. And, and, and then you have the, the problem of will, right? Um, even if we are one, I, I think it's a hard thing to argue that we have a, a, a unified will. Like, even if we are a unified R, uh, you know, I'm... We a, have alien hand syndrome. Yeah. But, like, when I argue with you, my my consciousness is split and you're not doing what I want you to do. Yeah. So, so, you know, I may, I may look at it and say my child who's, who's very lively and has a long life ahead of him, he needs a heart transplant. Well, you being a much older person, your heart matches. Uh, if I kill you, I'm part of you. So mm -hmm. I haven't really, I've just chosen that this new form of me mm -hmm. is okay. And when I kill you and harvest your heart to put in this, you know, that, that's where this oneness view, this, this non-separation really runs into issues because <laughs> there, there's no question that we have a separation of will. We mm -hmm. have different wills. Um, now certain creatures have been, uh, very able to contend with this idea. Take bees or ants, for example, in which in which there's a unified will to protect the queen or a unified will to do this, and and they are more than willing to sacrifice themselves. Unfortunately, humans uh, weren't gifted or cursed, depending on how you look at things, <laughs> with that 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 world view. Um, and and but when you look at ants, if you asked an ant, hey, you, you got to kill that other ant and harvest its organs to save the queen. It's no question. The other ant's going to look at it stupidly if it doesn't choose to kill him. Like, yeah, yeah. you need to kill me, the queen, you know? Um, so uh, the, the the problem of wills becomes becomes really interesting, not just across humans. I mean, we, we talk about the, the privilege and power of, that humans have as, as humans, but um, even looking at the beaver chopping down the trees to make the dam, right? He even has... A, a, a separate wheel from the trees that he is, you know, taking down to block a river, you know. Yeah. So this is making my head hurt. <laughs> uh, so on that note, to give your head a break, do we have any other thoughts on this? Because that kind of yeah, that touches on all the things I was. There is something in. I wanted to talk about that I've kind of been saving here. Uh, okay. I kind of want to go through here and 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 just compare this idea that uh, that everything is a commodity. Mm -hmm. versus ecocentrism that it's not 
and, and what the value of the two different philosophies are. Because I would argue, and, and it's largely from a, you know, a, a, a capitalist uh, uh, perspective, that looking at everything as a commodity actually is, is more likely to save, save, save the environment than, than, than not looking at it as, as a commodity. And I kind of wanted to talk about that with you all a little bit. What do you, what do you think about that idea of industrocentrism, the thought that, that everything's a commodity? Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned something that, well, first of all, I think, you know, to some extent you're right, everything is a commodity because being a commodity, in my mind, is not a a, a, a state of beings such as being carbon versus being gold is, yeah. right, and, and a range of protons. It's a, it's, a, it's a state of view, like I can view you as a commodity or I can view you as a person. And it's my view that then determines yeah, are yeah. you a commodity and how I use you. And so the the fact of whether any one thing is a commodity is not really dependent on that thing. It's dependent on the things around it. So so there's an interesting thing there. But um, whenever whenever you talk about saving the environment, I have a, a question about what that word means, the environment. Because it's a proper noun, the. Yeah, yeah. The environment. Well, so I'll, what? Say the earth. Okay. I, I, what I look at with this, I look at it and I go, you know, Cattle has a great value to us. Yeah. It's a very powerful commodity. Cattle are not going to go extinct because of that. Because because it's a commodity, we have gone through a lot of work to to preserve it. You know, for years the American alligator was not ha, had no value to us, and we tried to kill it. But 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 here's where my question comes to to the environment. Yeah. Mars has an environment. The Ice Age had an environment. Yeah, yeah. We have an environment now. So what is the environment? Is it to take a still shot in time now and say the environment should always be this? Is it to allow the natural progression? Like, what does that even mean? Yeah, I think, the that's, environment? I think that, that's an interesting mm-hmm. question. I think, it's, I, I think it's about preserving the environment as it is. Okay. And I think, that's, I think that's really the goal of most of these, uh, you know, most of these, the, the, these ecocentrists are not trying to preserve an environment. We're going to have that regardless. They're trying to preserve this environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, They've or, somehow managed to determine that this environment is better than the environment we'll have in the future. Yeah, and 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 somehow is you know managed to make that that uh, to me intellectual disconnect that the environment uh, you know that we have now is different than the environment we had. 10,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. There's, there, yeah. This is the one we have to preserve, and, and you know, no matter what. Yeah, well, there's a point at which if you go far enough back, the environment that existed was not one in which humans could survive. Yeah, it's gases. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's molten lava yeah. shooting everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, how far back do we want to go? Do we want to preserve that environment? Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, I just kind of want, want to touch on touch base on that. Do you mm-hmm. think that there's a value to this idea of of seeing the world as a commodity. So I think, um, and anybody who's listened to the show for very long will probably recognize this this framework. Um, I think there is value in having both the, um, the idea that everything is a commodity and the idea that we need to preserve things because I think either of those unchecked um, can lead to some severe problems. And, and so, I mean, have you ever gotten involved in a project and everything else around you kind of falls away and you're trucking along, not considering how long you've been working on it and what other commitments you might have, um, or who's calling on the phone because fuck it, I'm busy, um, or any number of other things. Yeah, this show for the last three years. Yeah, right. (laughs) And so you kind of, you kind of forget about everything else when you get really involved in this idea. And I think either side of that, the commodity side or the um, ecocentric preservation side can get too bogged down in its own, in its own philosophy. And I think it needs the other one to pull back and forth so that we can find that middle at which we can continue as a species without hopefully destroying or inhibiting um, the progression of not only ourselves, but everything else. Yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, as, as I listen to this more and more, I, the, the, the line, or I shouldn't even say line, the sliding scale because we know, we know there's a scale. We, I, I don't think we can define it well. But we know there's a scale between uh, 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 anthropocentrism, anthropocentrism. Uh, biocentrism, or- biocentrism, 
biocentrism and um, ecocentrism. We know there's a scale there, and we know they go in that order. Any other order doesn't make sense, but th there's some question as to why. And 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 I think you you could argue uh, uh, the 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 uh, circles like ones contain another. But I think the the real thing that that hits home to me is it's a level of risk tolerance across all three, right? Because uh, when we talk about doing what's best for humans, I think we really talk about doing what's best for humans right now. Yeah, absolutely. And we talk about taking risks in our long term, right? When we talk about uh, preserving all life as it is, we know all life as it is is a balance that can preserve humans and other lives as well. We can talk about values on life. And so it's a medium risk view because no matter what's happening to the environment, it's unlikely to hurt us as long as all the other life is preserved. And I think when we talk about ecocentrism and preserving things as they are now um, long term, it's a very low risk regret avoidance tactic yeah. in which we say, look, there may be better ways for things to be. But I know that things are okay right now. Yeah. And so why would we risk changing that and our great-grandchildren have to deal with whatever horrible calamity that may may come through just because it may be a little bit better when we can just leave things alone and make sure that they stay the way they are now and, and we don't have to even worry because the wrong risk, the right risk – could make things a lot better for us, but the wrong risk could make us never have a chance to take the right risk later. So why play this game of, of risking things when we can just say, it's fine now, leave it alone. Just right, right where it is. <laughs> so your analysis there um, reminded me of something, a couple of dots that I hadn't previously connected. Um, I think most people would agree again, speaking U.S. specific here, that a significant portion of the environmental movement has been a left-leaning movement. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, your analysis that their goal here is to keep things the way they are now sounds very similar to the conservative goal on the right-leaning side, one social, one environmental. But I do find that to be really interesting, um, that this idea that neither side wants to take these this specific set of risks. Um, social, in conservatives ver social conservatism versus environmental conservatism. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So. Okay, interesting. Well, interesting. interesting. Thing. Anything uh, else, guys? I think we have uh, covered this one. I, I don't know if I made any movement, but we've covered this one. So. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. And and you know, honestly, one of the uh, one of the setbacks we had in this show is we didn't really have a a good voice who has maybe lived these philosophies. Yeah. We've done a little bit of study on it, um, but we 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 didn't have a, a really strong voice that can explain some of these questions. I wish we would have, um, mm -hmm. but hopefully. Uh, if you've not heard of this before, this will open your eyes to a new view, yeah. and maybe you can... Definitely you know, worth looking at. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, worth absolutely. looking at when you do. Um, let us know. Sylvia, I want you to let us know what you thought of the show and our evaluation of it. Um, is there anything that you were hoping we covered that uh, we missed? Um, and yeah, this show started out pretty rough, <laughs> especially when I realized that my notes didn't save at all. Um, but I think it turned out okay. Yeah. If they want to support the show, John, what can they do? Absolutely. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash six pack philosophy. Um, and we have a, a large host of, uh, rewards you can get, uh, all the way from just getting a simple koozie every year as our, as our stuff changes, which we've they're just coming ordered. in and they're going to go out as soon as they do. Absolutely. So we, we have the new one made. It's ordered. It's being printed. Oh, they look good, too. Mm -hmm. They do. They do. I, I was really happy. I'm hoping they look as good as they did in the computer. Yeah. Um, all the way to getting early access to our shows on YouTube, uh, getting special content that you won't get otherwise, uh, getting to watch this live as we record it. Uh, we do a little bit of cutting, editing, and, and everything, and you can get to watch us live as well as uh, interact in the chat. Yeah. If, 
at certain levels. So that's all the Patreon stuff. That's how you can financially support us, and not just financially support us, but get a little extra. Uh, we want to give back to you for for helping us out. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't find the time, the will, or you just don't love us that much, <laughs> uh, if you could at least give us a like, if you did like it, subscribe if you want to see more, and share it with your friends. We have a swag store, so we got yes. some shirts here you can Teespring. buy. Uh, yeah. So these we've got the new the new brand shirts. Yeah. Yeah. We don't even have we haven't even ordered ours yet. So. Yeah. <laughs> So um, it'll be fun. And we even have a super cool, like, canvas print that you can get and hang on your wall. Yeah, we're, we're it, thinking we're going to nice. get one up there. Yeah. Anyway, um, let me ask you this. What if they want to support us, and they have, but we don't put out enough content for them? They they, they want to see, they want to stay What do you want to see? Tell us. We'll do it. We Sylvia told us what she wanted to hear, and we did it. I threw that ball up there, and you just didn't even I hit it. a home damn run. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. No, one, one. You're supposed to be suggesting another social media podcast. For oh, you. Yeah, I'm uh. throwing you a softball here. <laughs> that was incredibly unclear. What, did like, you get it? So I thought unclear. it was pretty clear myself. Yeah, <laughs> so unclear. So, I think you've been drinking too much of that bad bad beer. <laughs> oh. I wish there was more of that bad beer. So anyway. Um, if you haven't caught the last couple episodes from this year, one of the things that we've started this year is um, recommending another podcast that we like. Um, the one that I wanted to introduce to you guys this week is The Partially Examined Life. Um, I actually got turned on to them when we were doing a show about, I think it was when we were going to do our show on hedonism. I know I was listening to them back when we were at our old location, you, yeah. you know, uh, so yeah, yeah. But um. And I absolutely loved their show on Stoicism. Um, actually, I think they did multiple shows on that one and have been listening to them ever since and would recommend them to anybody. They are yeah. fantastic. That's a good show. That's a um, good show. A little more, a little more highbrow than us, um, but it's good if you've more already got a- More academic, less beer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you've already got a basis in philosophy, it, it's a great place to go. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, with that, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to hit us up on social media and let us know what you want us to talk about next time. Um, we'll see you next week. Cheers, guys. See you next week. Cheers. Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 